Thank you, Father, that we can spend a day studying your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can look at these things that the early church did. Please inspire me as I speak and those who are watching on Vimeo and YouTube around the world, I pray, Father, that you'll open their spiritual eyes, you'll open their hearts, you'll open their spiritual ears, that they may hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches in these last days. Yeah. I ask it in your name. Amen. 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 Well, hello. This is the series on the early church life and the studies are taken from this book fellowship we've been through the first book breaking of bread and now we're looking at fellowship the four things the early church did were apostles doctrine fellowship prayer and communion and so we're on fellowship we've had the first study this is the the second study and maybe it it doesn't seem to fit in with fellowship but I'm asking the question, why did God create man? I'd just like to read a verse from Psalm 68 and verse 6. And it says this, God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those that are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Why have I chosen that scripture? Well, the subject is fellowship. Family life should be fellowship. Church life should be fellowship. God doesn't like man to be alone. It says, God setteth the solitary in families. And those that are bound with chains, he bringeth out those that are bound with chains. The rebellious dwell in a dry land. The, the rebellious are independent. That's a sign of re rebellion, independence. I'll do what I want. I don't need anybody. I'll do my own thing. But those who are not independent, God sets them in families. It's very important. It's not good that man is alone. Something for you to think about. So I'm going to ask the question, why did God create man? Well, the Westminster Catechism has lots of questions and answers. And one of them is, what is the chief end of man? What's the chief end of man? And this is the answer. Because this is the Westminster Catechism. This isn't the Bible. But, but it may be right, maybe not. And the answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Is that biblical or is it just nice church doctrine? Well, what does it mean to glorify God? It, there's two uses of the word as far as I can ascertain. The first is to show his character. Moses said, show me your glory. He was saying, what are you really like, God? What's your essence? And God hid him in the rock and described his character, 100% merciful, 100% just. So often in the Bible, you can substitute the word character. We grow from glory to glory. It's an incremental change. We glow in character more like Jesus, more like Jesus. We renew our minds daily and slowly we end up with the mind of Christ. It's a process. So that's one use of the word glory. And the other is to give the honour that's due to God. We give him the glory, give him the honour. Uh, we do that to a judge. We say, yes, your honour. We honour the judge because he, he can send us to prison. He has a lot of power, a judge. So we, we give him the glory, we give him the honour. So is that the chief aim of man? To give honour to God, to show his character? Well, surely, I think that we should glorify God in, in both senses of the word. Whether that's our chief aim, I'm not sure, but I can't argue with that, to glorify God. But is that why God made us? That's our aim. If that's our aim, let's suppose that that's right. We have to glorify God, show his character. Is that why God made us? I want to challenge that. It may be our aim, but God, you know, our aim and God's aim are not always the same. I believe that God made man because he wanted fellowship. I think God made man because God needed fellowship. I know Christians say, God has no needs, God doesn't have any needs. Well, I, I disagree with that. If you love, you have needs. God is love. And love has to love, so it's reciprocated. You love because you want love. 
And if God is a lover, then he needs people to love him. Love gives you needs. Love makes you vulnerable. If you don't want to be vulnerable, don't love. Don't love. It's painful. To love hurts. People will hurt you. The people closest to you will hurt you. We sing the song, don't we? You always hurt the one you love, the one you shouldn't hurt at all. But love is funny. It makes us sensitive, so we hurt when we shouldn't be. Because we love somebody so much that, that it hurts us. And yet somebody else could say something, somebody who doesn't love us, they could say something and it's, it's water off a duck's back. It doesn't affect us, but somebody close, somebody that you, you love, they can just look at you a different way and, and you sense there's something wrong. Love makes you vulnerable. And God is vulnerable in the sense that he needs love. And I believe he created man because he wanted fellowship. He wanted love. Let me try and paint the picture or at least give you something to think about if I can't convince you. Before God created man, we all agree he had billions of angels. They could worship him day and night. A billion angels to worship God. The seraphim, the cherubim, holy, 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 holy. They, they worship God day and night. So if all he wanted was to make man to worship him, what, what's wrong with the angels? Surely he wanted more than worship. You can worship and not love. This is the problem with worship. I don't believe angels have a capacity to love. I've studied it, maybe you haven't, and maybe you think that's ridiculous. But I can't find anywhere in the Bible where it says angels love God. They worship him, they serve him. But I don't think they can love him. It said that angels look to inquire into salvation. I think the angels were looking down from heaven when they were crucifying Jesus. I don't think for one minute they thought he would die. He said, I can call a legion of angels and they'll come and rescue me. And I think they were waiting for the call. Because when they were going to throw Jesus over the brow of the hill... The angels came, parted the people, he walked through it. They'd saved Jesus many times. The storm on the sea. I'm sure it was Satan trying to kill Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus said, be still. Surely it was the angels that did it. They're God's servants. God, God's the boss. God sat in heaven. God doesn't run around like a scolded cock, sorted all the world's problems out. Why does he have a billion angels? Are they not messengers? Are they not servants? It's like Satan's not running around all the time. He's got a billion demons to get into people. Satan is the general and he's got millions of demons and he instructs them. He's at the head. My father taught me about war tactics and um, he had a, a general he really liked, Norbert his name as I can't remember the, his surname, but he said he never went into battle. He always sat. He sent the troops into battle and the general's at the back, and the messengers come, the enemy's on this flank, we've just lost that, and he listens, and he assesses it in the cold light of day, not when mud and bullets are flying around, you make bad decisions, so he stood back from the fight, and he's assessing it, and say, yeah, do this and do that. So, the devil's the general, and he's at the back, um, giving instructions to the troops, and so it is with God, there's an order. We know how a battle works in the natural. And a natural battle, a natural army, is only a, a, a shadow of the spiritual battle. The real battles are spiritual battles, surely. So God has a billion angels to worship. Why make man? I believe because God wanted fellowship with man. Let me just, in case you're thinking angels worship God, that proves love. Worship does not prove love. Do you want a scripture? They worship me with their mouth, God said to Israel, but their heart is far from me. So you can worship God and not love him. You could worship God and hate him. One day every demon will bow the knee and worship. Every demon will worship God. They'll still hate him. They're never going to repent. Not one demon will ever repent. I've never heard of any demon getting saved. 
In the Bible, there's no hope for demons. Not one of them can repent and be saved. They're already reserved for the lake of fire. But they'll worship God. They'll give him the honor that's due and say, you are the real God. Satan is not the real God. You are the real God. But they won't love him. If you love, you'll worship. But worship does not prove love. So the angels worshipped God, they gave him the honour and the praise and the glory that was due, but I don't believe the angels had the capacity to love God. They weren't made in the image of God. God didn't make angels in his image, he made man in his image. Why? Why different than the angels? Because we have a capacity that dogs and cats have and birds don't have and angels don't have. We can love God from our own free will. That's amazing. To think that I'm made in the image of God with the capacity to be a God. An angel can never become a God. Man can become a God. The day you eat of the wrong tree, you'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. That was the truth. The lie was you won't die. That was the truth because God said, the next chapter, Behold, man has become like us to know good and evil. Man has become God. That's why we send men to the moon. That's why we've got all these fantastic inventions. That's why I can speak here and people can watch me in the Philippines and Australia and Africa. It's unbelievable. If you told your granny what was happening, she'd think it was black magic. That you could look at something on a picture on the wall, a flat screen, and see something happening in another country. She'd say that's magic. But it's normal to us. In fact, the kids are growing up even knowing that how it works. If you're my age, and most of the people don't know how television works, you just switch it on. But the kids now, they actually know how computers work. My son's a computer programmer, so he actually writes the codes for things. It's amazing, isn't it? So we're different than every other creature that God's created. Different than the seraphim, different than the angels. We have the capacity to love God, and that's what God wanted. Can you see how fellowship, true fellowship, based on love is so important, so lacking in the church, so lacking in communities? The difference between us and angels and animals, we have a free will. It's, it's different. I know animals uh, seem to love, they, they're very endearing and they have instincts, but they don't have the capacity to love. And God wants us to love him from our hearts because we've chosen to do so. He wants us to reciprocate his love, not out of uh, compunction or compulsion, but because we're doing it from a willing heart. We love him because he first loved us. Let me give you another scripture. 1 John 4, 19. That's the one I've just quoted. John says, we love him because he first loved us. So surely that's why he loved us, so we would love him. So it's reciprocated. Well, I've been talking about love. What's love got to do with fellowship? Well, everything, everything. It's impossible to have fellowship with people you don't love. You can't have fellowship with people you hate. So if we don't love one another, we won't have fellowship. We may socialise, we may go to the same church, we may have the same doctrines, but if you don't love them, you can't have fellowship. You have to, it's a part, I'm talking about Christian fellowship, spiritual fellowship. Fellowship's an expression of love. If you love somebody, you crave fellowship. If you love somebody, you crave their companionship, you crave to be near them, you crave that intercourse, discourse, you want to share your, your thoughts with them, share your fears. If you love, you, you crave fellowship, you can't separate it. The more you love, the more you want fellowship and the closeness and unity that comes of being together. You know that if you've been in love. You crave to be near the person, to talk intimately. You don't want to talk about the football match and, and the inner workings of a combustion engine. When you're with your, your wife, somebody you love, you want to talk about other things. That, those are the things to talk about when you're having your meal and you bore your wife. 
But, you know, when you're in the bedroom, when you're intimate, somebody's laughing in the audience, I'm sorry. But when you're in the... When you're in the close proximity, when you're sharing and loving together, you want to be intimate. Well, I believe God's great plan was to show his love. That's why he made man, not to, out of some experiment, God wanted to show his love. If you're a lover, you want to show your love. If I'm a lover and I have nothing to show my love on, I'm frustrated. That's why I look for a woman and that's why I want children. That's, I want to love people. And God wanted to show his love. And I've written seven volumes um, Israel, the church, the kingdom of God. I, so I'm not going to go into that. I've called it the history and future of God's people. God's dealing with his people. And in it I show, hopefully over seven volumes, that God's plan was for love, romance and family life. We're all going to end up as a family. God will sit us on his knee and wipe away the tears from our eyes like a good father and say, don't worry, all the pain's over. All the frustration's over. All the anguish is over. It'll be wonderful. He's going to comfort us like a father and say, welcome to my family. God's not going to be the big ogre and the judge in eternity. He's going to be a father. Completely different role because we'll be like him. So he doesn't have to be a, a, a God to us. We'll be like him. When we see, we'll have spiritual bodies. We'll be eternal. We'll be a family. We'll be actually the family of God. It'll, it'll be fantastic. So God sent his son only to reconcile us back to God so that we could be part of his family. We're not reconciled to Christ. Christ came to reconcile us to the Father because he's the head of the family. And uh, love always wants unity. Fellowship is unity. Love wants unity. And unity always bears fruit. When a woman and man come together... In unity, it produces fruit. And God wants us to bear fruit. He wants us to be fruitful. Love and fellowship are, are fr should be fruitful. Christian fellowship should be very fruitful. We should provoke one another. We should um, deposit seeds in each other. This is what I've read this week, brother. And I've got a little seed of life I want to deposit into your heart. And you go home and it sparks something off on you. And you say something. I was reading this and I've thought about this in the Bible. And I think, wow, that's good. And it's a seed. And it produces fruit in me. When we come together, fellowship should, should bear fruit, shouldn't it? Because it's based on love. I'll just condense the seven volumes into a sentence. I'll just read it so I don't preach seven books uh, and take all day. Um, is it on the screen, Joanna? Yeah. The plan of God's all about love, romance and family life. Without family life, there's no true relationship, fellowship or unity. So this is a condensing the, the, the seven books. God chose Israel as his wife and they produced a son, Jesus. The Holy Ghost is now preparing a bride for God's son. When he returns to earth, he will restore Israel, God's wife, at present put away for her whoredoms and adultery, back to God, and collect his bride to present her to his father. And he'll consummate the marriage. That's Christ and the church. The family of God will be there, then be complete and live happily ever after on the new earth for eternity. All those who are not in relationship with God will not be in eternity with God's family. That's the plan. It's, it's whether you'll be in fellowship with God now and in fellowship with God in eternity. Because it's a family. And if you're not part of the family of God, if you're not in fellowship with God and his bride or the wife of God, then you won't be part of eternity. You'll be outside in utter darkness, damnation. I'm going to say a strong statement. All religion is vanity. All religion is worthless. And it's always wrong. And any religion, whether it's Hinduism, communism, which by definition is a religion, Satanism, Christianity, 
They're all vanity. Why? Why are they always wrong? Because they fight against the principle of a spiritual family. Religion fights against family. And it substitutes it with organisation. If you've got organisation, you've not got an organism, a living family. So that's why it's always vanity. It has to be wrong. As soon as you bring organisation into the organism, you've got the counterfeit. You've got religion. And it substitutes it with organisation, manipulation through fear and power over people. Every religion wants to impose its ideology on the masses. My own so-called religion, Christianity, it wants to expose its ideas on the world. That's anti-biblical. It wants to Christianise the world. It wants to take over the world and Christianise it. And somehow they think that that's God's plan. But they've never read the Bible. We're the light in the darkness. We have to preach to the whole world. But few find a way of life. Few find discipleship. Many on the broad road. It was never meant that we Christianise the world and make a religion and impose it on the uninitiated. We're not supposed, supposed to impose our values outside. Fancy asking a sinner not to sin. We ask them to find Jesus and that solves the problem. What do you expect sinners to do? That's what they do, sinners sin. So why should we tell them off for doing this? And That's not biblical. God wouldn't like that. Well, of course he wouldn't. But we're not supposed to impose God's principles on the world. We're supposed to impose God's principles on the church. I know that's radical, but I, you'll have to prove it different from the Bible. I can't find anywhere. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. It never says take the cities for Jesus. It never says Christianise the world. It says those that believe will be saved. Those that don't will be damned. None of your business, the results. You just preach to everyone. And the remnant prepare. All the epistles are preparing those who believe. Preparing them to be the bride of Christ, to be the family. How to have fellowship with one another until we get to the true fellowship with Christ. Goodness me, if we can't have fellowship now with, with fellow believers, how are we going to have fellowship with God? Do we, do we think that we're falling out with the church and criticising the church and, and the true believers? Do we think that God will say, oh, come into my family? He'll say, you can't come in my family, you'll disturb it. We've got to prepare now. For me, religion is no different than politics. Imposing your ideology on the masses. Vote for us. And we'll solve your problems. That's religion. Become a Christian. Become a Hindu. Become a Buddhist. Be become a Muslim. They all say that if you, if you become a Muslim, we'll solve the world's problems. We'll have to do it with the sword or we'll have to do it through peace, inner peace, Hinduism, whatever. But they're all trying to solve the world's problems. If you vote for them, if you become a Hindu, if you become a Christian, it's not to do with that. It's a, a relationship with the living God. A relationship always fights against religion and religion will hinder a relationship with God. People can live without God but they can't live without religion. I heard a quote from Napoleon said that. He says people can live without God they can't live without religion. They need it. Everyone in the world has some religion and if they say I'm an atheist then they worship a pop star or Manchester United. We are made to worship. You cannot not worship. It's impossible. We are made to worship. So everyone has a religion. They do things religiously. Christians, or I'm saying Christians in, in the sense of the biblical word, they're supposed to be free. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Religious, the, ve the very word, the Latin word means to bind, to adhere to. A religion, we adhere to it. We don't adhere to a set of rules. We adhere to a person, God himself. That's who we cling to. That's who, who we adhere to. That's where we get our catechism from. Not from men, but from God. It's a fellowship with God, not with a, a system. Jesus said few would find the way of discipleship and many would be on the road to ruin. That's wood, hay and stubble, not, not damnation. 
Jesus said he would build his church. It's not the job of the minister to build the church or, or his denomination. Jesus said, I'll build my church. We reconcile men to God. That's the job of the ministry. We reconcile men to God and he builds the church. We don't build it. We introduce people to God and put God inside people. And we don't try and build the church. Jesus says, I'll build my church. He never told us to build it. He said, preach the gospel. Teach, when they say, teach all these things. Another quote from Napoleon, he said, religion's excellent stuff for keeping common people quiet. It stops the poor from murdering the rich. He wasn't a Christian. That's what people think. They, they know what religion does. They know it's a form of politics. That's why there's always a concordat when there's a world dictator. He always makes a concordat with the Pope. The most powerful religion. Napoleon made a concordat with the Pope. So did Hitler. Because they know that they work together. People need religion. A political system needs a religion. That's why in the last days there's two beasts rise out of the sea. The one world dictator and the Antichrist. They always work together. Politics alone cannot control people. They also need religion. But they're the same. They just work together. Well, from my observation, maybe I'm overcritical, but from my observation, Christians seem to prefer religion to relationship. They love duty. God's people never want to be free. They only think they want to be free. Can I say that again? God's people don't want to be free in reality. They only believe they want to be free. Example. God delivered two and a half million people. He freed them from 400 years of slavery. They got in the desert. Did they want to be free? They wanted the flesh pots of Egypt. They wanted the leeks and the cucumbers. It was boring being free. Same food every day. No security. Freedom is intolerable to most Christians and God's people. It's, read history. When God frees them and brings a revival, what happens? In two years, we've got a denomination again. We've got another... John Wesley came and brought revolution, really, to, to Great Britain. And then we started Methodism. We started religion, because that's what we prefer. The Pentecostal movement, people from all denominations got filled with the Holy Ghost, they got thrown out. So we formed Assemblies of God and Four Square Elim and Apostolic Church of God. We form religions because we don't want to be free. God frees us. Revival is God freeing his people from religion. That's what revival is. If it doesn't free them from religion, it's not revival. That's God's revival. It frees them from religion. And very soon, we organise, well, there's a lot of money coming in. We need a treasurer and we need a secretary. And we better have a, go a board of a directors, you know, to, to make people accountable. And we get an organisation. We start a religion because people don't want to be free. It's scary. And, and what minister wants is people to free. They may not go to his church. They may go to another church. Oh, no, you've got to come to my church. That's why you're a member. You're committed. And you have to pay your tithes to my church because you're a member. That's why we have memberships to control people. It, the church can't exist without membership and control and tithing. It's sad, isn't it? If I seem overcritical, forgive me. I, I've been there. I've been in the system, so I understand how it works. And God's freed me and I'll never go back. Amen. But I understand I'm not judging people who are in there. That I, if God hadn't opened my eyes, I'd still be there, religious little Morris, doing his duty, teaching the converts like I did all the doctrines that now I've scrapped half of. Tying people to what we believe, because we're assemblies of God, so we know better than everyone else. So I was tying people to that and tied to the local church and all those things that we do. I see slogans on Facebook often, you know, nice little pictures, and it says, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. And that's a lie. Christianity is a religion. Of course it is. How can you say anything else? You only have to look at the facts. It's a religion. Relationship frees you from religion. 
If you have a relationship with God, you don't need a religion. If you have a religion, it hinders a personal relationship with God. So let me come to an end. I believe that's why God created man, because God wanted fellowship. God wanted love, and love craves fellowship. So most Christians know all about God, because that's what religion does. It teaches you about your God. If you're a Muslim, you'll learn all about Allah. If you're a Hindu, you'll learn all about the gods. If you're a Buddhist, you'll learn all about Buddha. If you're a Christian, you'll learn all about God. you learn about God. That doesn't mean you know God. I've given the illustration many times, but it's the best one I know. I know the Queen of England. I could spend half an hour telling you about her. I know she has corgi dogs. I know her husband's calls Phillips. I know the names of her children and her grandchildren. I know she, where she goes for her holidays. I know she has a, a royal yacht, Britannia. I could go on and on. I know where she lives in Buckingham Palace. And so I could tell you her age, some of her history. And I know all about, I could convince you that I know the Queen. But if I was in London and I met her, and I said, oh, hello, Elizabeth, how's Philip doing and the children? She'd say, excuse me, I don't know you. So the question is to, to Christians, and I'm challenging you, it's not, do you know God? Of course you do, he saved you. Well, I'm one of the Queen's citizens. I'm one of the Queen's subjects, of course she knows me. Only as a subject, I know her, I'm one of her subjects. But personally, I don't know the Queen. She'd say, I don't know you. So the question is, not do you know God, I accept you know God, does God know you? That's a scary question. If you stood before God, would he say, I know you? Don't forget Matthew 7, the Sermon on the Mount. People who'd cast devils out, heal people, prophesied and done wonderful works in Jesus' name, and he accepted that. Do you know what he said? Matthew 7, 21. Jesus said, not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord. Well, you only say Lord if you're serving. Satanists don't call Jesus Lord. So if you say Lord, Lord, it means you're serving God. Not everyone that says shall enter the kingdom. They may be saved, they've got eternal life, but to reign with Christ, to be the bride of Christ. But he that doeth the will of my Father... Christians know about God's work, but they don't know God's will because they're not doing it. They're not doing what's in the Bible. Many, well, many's the majority, isn't it? Many will say to me in that day, few is the minority, many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works? Listen to this. And then, Jesus, I will profess unto them. So this is Jesus. This is not uh, heaven and hell. This is not the great white throne and God. This is Jesus, the judgment seat of Christ, his own people. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. You knew me. You used my power. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. So to use God's power when you don't know him is actually a work of iniquity. To do God's work when it's not God's will is actually a sin. It's a work of iniquity. He said, I can't acknowledge you. You did my work. You healed people. That's my work. You prophesied good, good prophecies. That was my work. But you don't know me. You know about me. You know my power. They obviously didn't have an intimate relationship with Christ. They weren't in fellowship with Christ. I don't know you. They were in fellowship with the church. They were in fellowship with the power of God, but not Christ himself. There's a world of difference. Let, let me read Philippians chapter 3. It's one of my favourite scriptures. This is what Paul said. Philippians 3 verse 10. This is his desire, his passion. That I may know him. Not know about him. Paul knew all about God. He knew about God before he, he even met Jesus. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knew all about God. There was nothing you could tell Paul about God. He knew the law. He knew about the law of God. He knew, but he says that I may know him, become intimate, be in fellowship with him, and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. This is the process. There's a sermon in each step, isn't there? If by any means I may obtain the resurrection, the first resurrection... 
Well, that's a short little study. Why God created man, I believe it was for, for fellowship. So that it could be in union. So we could show our love by wanting to be with him. Well, if God made man because he desired fellowship, it's no wonder it's one of the four things the early church did. You have to consider it. If the early church revival, the beginning, we've got to say that was the purest. If the early church met together, no buildings for 400 years, no church doctrine at all. They met together from house to house. Apostles teaching, that's what they'd heard from Jesus. That wasn't church doctrine. Thomas Aquinas and those people uh, were not even on the scene for hundreds of years. Apostles teaching, prayer, breaking of bread, and fellowship. If that's one of the things they did, it's imperative, it's paramount that we understand what true fellowship is. And so we, we've, we'll finish there. We've got some more studies today. Lord, please help us. Father, I'm not trying to insult the church, insult religion. Lord, I've been there, I understand. I just want to free people. Give us insight, Lord, to what true fellowship is, what true relationship is, and how that religion hinders it. Duty fights against love. Fights against true fellowship. Please help us, Father. We have a long way to go, but we desire that we can know you, that we can be intimate with you. To obtain this resurrection, to be the bride of Christ. To hear the words, well done, good and faithful. And not, I never knew you. Please help us, Father. I ask it in your name. Amen.